So just a brief review of what we went on last week. We started out with the notion that everybody is going to be underneath that big umbrella of the medical model. And the medical model is simply you take symptoms, you slap all the symptoms together, the physician, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the therapist, from those symptoms comes up with what they believe to be the best conglomerate of symptoms. We call that a diagnosis. And then we work on decreasing symptoms uh, in order to try to alleviate whatever pain, whether that be physical pain, whether that be psychic pain, whether that be emotional pain, that is the medical model. So everything is falling under the medical model. Biological model is what physicians tend to use and psychiatrists fall under the umbrella of physicians. So the biological model basically says if there's a problem, we can attribute it to abnormalities of the brain or that really fun term that really doesn't mean a whole lot, but we use it all the time, chemical imbalance, right? We don't know what a chemical imbalance is, but we say it all the time like we know what it means. Um, moving forward from there, we talked about the psychoanalytic model. The psychoanalytic model, the psycho, it is, what person? Freud. So if it's Freud, probably your mom's fault. And if it's your mom's fault, it has something to do with early childhood. So it's uh, stages of development that cause us to have problems later on. The big influence there is the subconscious and the unconscious. So it's not really what we're thinking about today. It's the stuff that's bubbling underneath that cause us our uh, psychiatric and our emotional and our psychic pain. Okay. So we're going to get into the behavioral and the cognitive model today. Those are the two big ones. And then we'll also hit on um, existentialism. We'll talk a little bit about sociocultural, and then we'll talk about um, the diathesis stress model, which um, your, your textbook kind of glazes over, which is very unfortunate because the diathesis stress model, probably the best integration of all of these different topics that we have. Okay, so we'll start with the behavioral model. And the behavioral model, I'll tell you right now, I told you this last week, the behavioral model is rarely seen completely by itself today. Normally we see it combined with the cognitive model to make the cognitive behavioral model. The only time you really use the, the behavioral model by itself is in a very um, carved out treatment called ABA or applied behavioral analysis, which is used in a very wide variety of treatments and, and populations, but is only uh, tested and proven to be effective with a very small population. And that very small population are people with, within the autistic spectrum who are under the age of eight. However, we still use ABA with all types of different people. We, uh, pretty much the spectrum, anybody within the spectrum, any age, we use ABA. People with developmental disabilities, people with neurological disabilities, and even people who are neurotypical, we still use ABA techniques with, okay? The behavioral model is based off of behaviorism. Behaviorism stems from functionalism. Functionalism is something that you forgot about from week one of Psych 101 because they probably never talked about it again. But basically, it is the things that we do and why we do them. Okay? So behaviorism is similar to psychodynamic in that in psychodynamic theory, our current behaviors are influenced by our early childhood behaviors and early childhood activities. In behaviorism, it doesn't necessarily need to be early childhood. It can just simply be any behavior or anything that happened prior to your current problematic behavior. Okay? So in behavioral model, we concentrate on the behavior and the environment. Behaviorists really don't worry too much about the inner working. Behaviorists really don't care that much about emotional state. They don't really care about the unconscious and the subconscious. They care about actions that are predicated by previous actions. Okay, so maybe someone prompted you in some way, someone acted on you in some way, somebody stimulated you in some way, that's an environmental factor, and then you reacted in some way. Or you acted in some way, and the environment acted upon you because of it, okay? 
this is basically the two kind of fundamental differences between classical and operant conditioning. You can go at it all different types of way, and, I, and I'll be the first to admit, classical and operant conditioning is one of those topics that seems really simple, and then you get into it, and it's really complex, but it really should be simple, okay? And one way to differentiate classical and operant conditioning is that classical conditioning, you are the way you are because of something that happened before your action. Operant conditioning is you are and you act the way you are and you are the way you are because of something that happened after the way you behave. Okay? Remember, operant conditioning is all about reinforcers and punishers. So I act in a certain way and I get reinforced or I get punished for it. Okay? Let's say I'm running late for class today. And so I decide really, really fast on very, very slick road. Okay? Now, in one, let's, say, let's use a multiverse. So there's a multitude of different universes where I drove to school today. In one universe, I drove to school 90 miles an hour and I got here on time. Okay? Was my speeding reinforced or punished? Of course, right? I got here on time. Nothing bad that happened. I, I didn't, I, I wasn't late for class. Therefore, am I going to be more or less likely to speed on icy roads in the future? More or less, right? Okay. Alternate universe B, I'm doing 90 and I walk into a ditch and flip my car. Reinforce or punish? Punish. Multitude of ways, right? First off, I flip my car. Secondly, probably get a ticket. Third, still late for class. You said about like people have anger right? Yes. Yes. That, that's one theory. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. He actually. Yeah. Um, I forget what he was talking about. But he, he approached that in a very different way, where I've never, I've never heard it before. But yes. Yeah, sure. Going to a mall. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's behaviorally anchored, which I've never heard of before. Phobia. Instance. Force someone to go on to the park. Builds upon. Yeah. So this one time I wreck, I'm punished. I'm late. All these bad things happen. Tomorrow. The weather's the same, am I going to speed or not? Probably not, okay? But my behaviors are anchored by what happens after I do what I'm going to do. Classical conditioning, on the other hand, is the best way to describe it is to go back to the beginning, little Albert. Everybody remember, remember little Albert? We go down and we get a free baby, because back in the day you could just get free babies, and you put a baby on the floor and the baby sees a rat, and what's the baby do? First time. Oh, no, nothing. Nothing. Wait, it picks up the rat, throws it around, bites its head off because babies are weird like that. They'll try to bite anything. They don't really do anything, but if the next day I show the rat, and as soon as the baby sees the rat, I make loud noise, baby screams, cries, throws a tantrum. Is the baby reacting to the rat? No. No. But we have now a connection. And after a couple days of doing that, baby sees the rat without the loud noise and, and all of a sudden starts to scream because of that bad affiliation, okay? So it's because of what happened before the behavior. So in the behavior model, we're trying to figure out, is the person engaging in this behavior because they're being reinforced or punished, or are they doing it because they have some weird association? And what's the only way to figure that out? Right? We got if it's reinforcer or punisher, we have to figure out you know what's going on. What happens if we modify the environment so they don't get reinforced or punished? What if we take away the punishment? Do they still engage in the behavior? Or do we try to look in their history a little bit, just a little bit, and see what is it that is that is linked together maladaptively with this person? And if we figure that out, we can move forward by trying to fix it. Okay? So we have operant conditioning, we have classical conditioning, and then we have modeling, which is kind of in the middle. It is more operant than it is classical. But modeling fails to have a true reinforcer or punisher. Modeling is, I see somebody else getting reinforced. Therefore, I'm going to engage in a behavior because I think I might get reinforced. So you could argue that it is projective operant conditioning, or it really does fit the criteria for classical conditioning because I see somebody else. 
I, I go to Walmart, favorite place to watch and observe behavior. <laughs> go to the checkout line, watch for kids and parents. Kid wants a Kit Kat bar. Walmart is pure evil. Let me just tell you. Kid walks up, they see a Kit Kat bar, and so there's two kids, in, one in each line, one kid's being good, the other one's like, Mom, I want a Kit Kat bar. Like, no, I'm not getting a Kit Kat bar. What's the kid do? Yes, mother, I will not get a Kit Kat bar today. Thank you for being so kind and giving me shelter and life. Right? <laughs> no, he goes, Mom, I want a Kit Kat bar. Fast forward five minutes, Mom, I want a Kit Kat bar! And what's the mom do? you one next time. Okay, so now baby over here, or kid over here, it's like, hmm, that kid threw a fit and got the kid got bar. Kid was being good. Kid had no intention. Kid had never been reinforced or punished for throwing a tantrum, but now they try it. Okay, so technically, the tantrum was a neutral stimulus before. It's like, I've never tried it. It didn't do any good for me. But now that I see somebody else do it and they get reinforced, now my neutral stimulus has become a conditioned stimulus and I'm hoping my mom doesn't want me to throw a tantrum just like that kid's mom didn't want that kid to throw a tantrum. And so modeling is in the middle because it's projective, operant, but kind of classical, okay? Just, just know, I mean, it's easy to understand what modeling is. You don't need to know all the intricate details to it. Um, the, the thing about behavioral models is that sometimes modeling is good. Again, what are your parents? Did your parents want you to hang out with the good kids and the bad kids? Why? Yeah. They want you to model themselves. I mean, uh, nobody wants Charles Manson, their child to look up to Charles Manson, right? It's like, oh, wow, Charles Manson, awesome dude, right? What they want you to do is look up to somebody who you might model your life after, okay? So they can produce really good behavior or they can produce really bad behavior. There's less, there's less clinical evidence to show that modeling can produce abnormal behaviors. We know that people can model into bad behavior, but when we're talking abnormal, we're talking about dysfunction. And there's not a lot of evidence to show that you can model yourself into a clinical issue. A lot of people think you can. Because if you hang out with the wrong crowd, you might get depressed because they're all depressed, so you're depressed. And so we have these theories um, that it kind of, they're, they're like Facebook theories where, you know, we, we have these misinterpreted events where people think if one, one kid at a school commits suicide, inevitably like 10 people are going to follow, right? You heard of this theory before? There's really no substantiated evidence to this, that somebody can model themselves into this, or that if a couple of bad kids shoot up a school, there's gonna be all these copycat things. Again, there's really no evidence to show that people can model themselves all the way to abnormality, okay? But you can start the process. And when we get to the diathesis stress model, I'll argue a little bit contradictory, because with the diathesis stress model, Modeling may be the thing that tips you over the edge, okay? So just kind of put that in the back of your mind. We'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So, operant conditioning. We don't care about animals, because we're not well. We don't care about other animals in this class. We care about animals, but humans. Learn to behave in certain ways because we get rewards or we get punished. If we get rewarded, are we going to do it more or less in the future? More. If we get punished, we should do it less, okay? That's operant conditioning. If you get into, if you just want to know what is operant conditioning, operant conditioning is really simple. However, operant conditioning is the basis of applied behavioral analysis, and it gets really, really in depth. Talking about schedules of reinforcement, talking about um, what is the motivating uh, stimulus, what is the unmotivating stimulus, uh, what is the thing that pre that is a precursor to uh, the operant. It, it gets really, really complicated, but on a simple level, it's basically just re rewards and punishers. Modeling, we've already talked about. Classical conditioning is the one where everybody kind of trips over themselves. And I even do this sometimes. And I've been, when I started, it's, it's funny because I was doing behaviorism when I started teaching. And I had no intention of ever teaching. 
I, I really didn't think I would ever step foot in a classroom. And then I got asked to, to be an adjunct over in South Bend, and lo and behold, I actually ended up liking it a bit. But at that time, I was doing um, behavioral consultation for people with developmental disabilities. And I was doing classical conditioning day in and day out, eight to 10 hours a day. This is all I was doing. And when I went to teach it for the very first time after not having the class for know, 10 years, I could not get through this. Because even though I was using it every single day, I didn't know the words. I didn't know the terms that I was using. And so I went back after a couple of years of teaching and I talked to all my, my colleagues at the practice that I was at and I, was, and I kind of gave them a test. And it was kind of sad because I had 15 masters and doctoral level clinicians and they would have flunked my chapter five 101 test. And that's what they were doing for a living because we didn't talk about the term. We, we didn't talk about unconditioned stimulus and neutral stimulus. We were talking about what the person was reacting to, which is the same thing. So the reason I kind of hit on this hard is because if you can conquer this, you can manipulate people to do whatever it is you want them to do. It's awesome. Worth the price of admission right here, okay? So what you have with classical conditioning is basically Pavlov's dog, okay? Pavlov's dog, everybody remembers the story of Pavlov, right? Pavlov is studying the digestive systems of dogs, he starts to realize that dogs are, when, the, when his uh, research assistants were coming in, the dogs would see the people and start to salivate, drool. Why is this a bad thing? If dogs are drooling when they see a human, what is it that they want to do to the human? Eat the human, okay? If your dog, how many of you have a dog in here? And you go to feed them, they start to drool and yip and get happy, right? You're not fearful they're going to eat you, right? Dog. You don't get scared because you already you you implicitly know classical conditioning that the meat causes your dog to salivate. Okay, so what happened was forget tone. Think about person in a white lab coat. The meat plus a man or a woman in a white lab coat comes in and the dog starts to drool, and eventually just seeing the person in a white lab coat with no food makes the dog start to drool. Same thing as if you have a dog, I will guarantee you, your dog cannot read. Okay? Dollars to donuts, I would put pretty much any amount of money on it that your dog cannot read. And yet, if you hold up a bag that says pedigree on it, your dog will start to drool, right? And you're just like, my dog can read. This is awesome. It reads dog food. Is that really what it's doing? No. It's seeing a bit. You could put like dog poison written on there, and the dog would still drool. Yeah, don't, don't be mean to buy them, that's me. But basically, big yellow bag is the same as tone. Meat makes dogs salivate. Meat comes in a big yellow bag, which makes dogs salivate. Big yellow bag eventually makes dogs salivate, okay? So, we're not dogs, right? We're gonna go with the fact that we are not dogs. <laughs> but we can be conditioned just the same as dogs. This used to be one of my favorite things I used to do uh, when we taught social psych. I haven't taught it in like three years now. I would have students walk outside in the hallways with a red octagon and just stand in the middle of the hallway. If you see a red octagon, what do you tend to do? You stop, right? So I'd have them stand in the middle of the hallway with like 10 minutes to go before class and a pile up of students would happen in the hallway. Why? They all stop because they've been conditioned that the, the student didn't say anything. Didn't say, whoa, whoa, stop. They just stood there. And then eventually I told them to just put the sign down and step aside and they would all start walking again. This is amazing if aliens were watching us because they'd be like, what are these people doing? Why are they stopping there? If I were to go down, if I were to be really cool, because today is not the day to do this. It's very icy out. But if I were to go down there and spray paint the stop sign to write big go on it. Red octagon, but it says go. Some of you would have a seizure trying to figure out what to do, right? You'd get there, and literally both feet would be pumping different brakes. Like a brake, gas, what do I do here? You'd be signaling people to go. Why? You've been conditioned to see the red octagon, and you've stopped, but your brain says go, 
but, but your body's like reacting to the octagon, but your frontal lobe is going with the go, and you'll just have a, a meltdown. It'll just be horrific. We've been conditioned the exact same ways. Not always that fun though. One of the major um, issues that have been completely classical conditioned, there's two uh, clinical disorders. One is a very common clinical disorder. Probably most of you have a very low level of this. What clinical disorder is completely 98% classical conditioning? Many of you have this in, on a very low level. OCD? No, not OCD. Anxiety. It is an anxiety disorder. We're getting closer. We're falling into the toilet, but we haven't flushed yet. Phobias. Phobias. How many of you have a phobia in here? Okay. What's your phobia? Just give me a few. Geese. Geese. Wasps. Wasps. Wasp. Heights. Heights. Spiders. Spiders. Okay. Claustrophobia. What? Pigs. I'm trying to choose between geese and pigs. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with pigs. Do you know why you're afraid of pigs? Yes. Um, I, my neighbor has one that keeps getting out, and it's like 300 pounds now, and it makes me crazy. Okay. That is not a phobia. Because a phobia is irrational and out of proportion. I will go in there and eat them or whatever. Like guinea pigs? Guinea pigs are fine. They're not pigs. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Long class for that. You just blew my mind for a second. I, just, I, I literally just had to stop. Um, okay, so like if I just brought in like a pocket like you, you have problems with that? Okay, so it's that is irrational, you understand that, right? Yes. Out of proportion to the actual danger? Yeah. Okay, so pig was it's funny, meat. Pig. Neutral <laughs> stimulus, right? Before all this happened, before you met mega pig. <laughs> so pig, like Fearful thing. So pig was neutral, okay, neutral. But big animal coming at you that is irrational is not, because that you know that would be a fearful thing. So big animal coming at you makes you fearful. Big animal coming at you that happens to be a pig also makes you fearful. Now all pigs make you fearful. Okay, it's basic classical conditioning, and for most people they completely understand. That it's irrational. Like sitting here, you you get it, right? Uh, it's not mind blowing to you that this is out of proportion. If I bring in a pot belly pig and you have a problem, but I'm with you. I have my own. If you've had me for any class before, you've heard this story. I apologize. I am a snake fear phobia person. I know where it comes from. It comes from my childhood. I was about four years old. Grew up on a farm. Okay, dad's a farmer. Anybody who has farmers in their family know. Farmers have a little bit of a warped sense of humor. Very. So one day he's doing small bales and he's, he's got two higher hands up in the hay now. He's putting the hay bales up on an elevator. It's going up and dropping down. I'm standing next to my mom. I'm about four or five years old. My dad's on the on the wagon. He's putting these up, putting these up. He picks up a hay bale, looks at it, smiles, and then turns it around, and my mom starts screaming. Hanging out the side of the hay bale is half a snake. Half a snake means no, that would make that would make logical sense, but it's dead. Oh, it's literally half of a snake. Okay, oh, okay. so should, should anybody be fearful of half a snake? I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> it depends Trust on me, what half. half a snake, fourth of a snake, a little bit, is not a problem. It depends on what and what kind of snake. True, very true. So my dad again works in humor, turns around, smiles, puts the hay bale on the elevator, it goes up and just kind of steps back and smiles. My mom is still screaming. And then about five seconds later, I see two grown men running out of the bar, screaming their heads off because that hay bale had come down and they saw the half a snake and they ran out, okay? So four-year-old Brad, who do I look to to find out if something is safe? Parents. So if mom is screaming about something, it's unsafe, right? I see two grown men screaming about it. It's unsafe, right? So four-year-old Brad is now irrationally afraid of snakes. I'm, and growing up, I was the kind of irrationally afraid of snakes where like if I opened up a book and there was a picture of a snake, I had to turn the page. I know it's not gonna bite me, but I don't need to take any chances. Like snakes on a plane, not watching. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. So did she burn it down? Did she burn it down? I don't know why she didn't. Grandpa would have been buying me a new house. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't have that rational fear snake. My grandfather's from Texas. He taught me. Oh. <laughs> he taught me how You're to start skipping. I'm never moving no. to <laughs> Texas, Arizona. He taught me how to kill a rattlesnake by step taking the heel of your boot and stepping on its head to stop moving. You know what else you can do? Run. <laughs> <laughs> which brings me to my next story, which is. <laughs> and then also gave me the skills of the rattlesnake. Fast forward to my. Uh, I want to say I was like 12, but I was 17. But here in the uh, have an irrational fear of wasps. Oh yeah, but wasps, they, they sting. And it hurts. So it stinks by it, so I understand that. I have, no, I have no evidence of that, though. No. That's the problem. Okay. It's irrational for me. So I'm 17-ish, let's say 17. Um, and I'm mowing the lawn, and I go around a tree, and what do I see? A snake. Big, huge, it's like, it, it was like 12 feet. And about this big around, it was coiled. No, it was like that long. Um, it was a black racer, and it was coiled up, and it was right beside a tree. Now I'm mowing, and there's a jungle gym, like a swing set, over by about where that wall is. And I have a mower that, if you let go, it turns off. By the time the mower actually turned off, as I was running towards the swing set, I was up on top of the swing set before the mower was off screaming and my mom came running out because she thought I'd like to cut off my own foot because I was screaming so loud. Now, irrational because what did I have? It was Brad versus snake and Brad had a lawnmower. Had a lawnmower, right? But thinking back, my irrational thought was, but what if I hit the snake just right and it hits the, the mower and it swings out the side and it comes out to bite me? <laughs> this is literally what I'm thinking. Two seconds after being the world's fastest white boy ever <laughs> running from there to there. Needless to say, I didn't mow again for a very long time. Now, I'm okay with snakes now. Okay, we have a truce. Um, I can be around them, we're pretty cool. Just don't surprise me. Like, like, the pe like, if you're one of those people that like to carry around a snake, like at the fair because you think it's cool, it's not cool. That is so no way. That is awful. But that is my phobia, and I know it's irrational. Around here, we have to be fearful of like one snake. It's like a, it's a rattler, I think we have to be. And I think we're starting to get water moccasins too. But anyway, most of the snakes we run into, are we pretty, are we okay? Is it irrational? Are we bigger than them? Especially if you have a mower? Yeah. So my fear is completely irrational. And it's been classically conditioned. How can I get rid of it? How did I, how, how did I somewhat, I don't want to say I got rid of it. Because you, somebody will show up with a snake in class and I'll have to. Literally, just you will get now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did not purposely expose myself, but I, I learned about because I, because in the summer I enjoy going to state parks, I enjoy going hiking, I enjoy going out mountain biking, and I figured out you know I need to get over this, so I kind of figured out what kind of snakes I need to look for. Um, even this last summer, I was pretty darn proud of myself that I was mowing and I saw a snake and I just froze instead of running. That was, that was progress. Um, <laughs> But I exposed myself to it. Okay, so there's two different ways to get rid of phobias. We'll talk about phobias later. But um, there's systematic desensitization, where I just keep like looking at snakes more and more. And then there's the fear factor way of getting rid of it, which is just um, you know just exposed, just mass exposure, which is not effective. <laughs> yeah, it's not effective because what happens if if okay, so your fear is wasps. Yeah, and so my what mom if, had a lovely nest inside her room through her window. So you just walked up to it and said, I'm just going to stand here and <laughs> no, I'm not I fearful a, anymore. No, I had to walk in and kill it. That's how I read it. So my daughter was the fear of wasps, and I go kill the wasps. And now you're not fearful, right? Because oh, no, you I conquered it. You know, I have a mind. You know, like no, I would say, you probably still, because you walk in and you were fearful because you're supposed to be fearful about it. That's part of the you know, you're you're over. And I don't, I don't want to ever truly get rid of my fear of snakes because that, there's that one in 100 snakes that, you know, the, the badass. I don't, want to, I don't want to mess with that snake. You know, I don't want to mess with that snake. But 
classical conditioning. Um, the therapist is a teacher. The goal is a teacher, not a healer. Okay. So if I went to somebody and I said, I really need to get rid of this thing because uh, I don't want to um, I, I don't need somebody to lay me down on the couch and talk about my early experiences with snakes. I need somebody who's a teacher who can give me information more so than peeling away the layers of the onion that is my fear. Okay? So a lot of times with, with this, instead of just stopping the behavior, we have to replace them with more appropriate ones. Okay? So where this comes in handy is addiction. Behavioral therapies have been shown to be relatively successful with some addiction. Because, again, I, I, we've talked about this before, but if you want to quit smoking, why don't you just quit smoking? I know I have a couple of people in here who said they smoke, right? A couple? Okay. Stop smoking. Ta-da! Right? Is that, is that the way it works? Yeah. No, because now what are you thinking about? Smoking. So I instead of I can't just say we're going to do smoking cessation, we have to replace every time that you normally would have behaved in a maladaptive way. So anytime you would have smoked, we have to replace it with something. So every time that you want to go smoke, you're going to eat. Not again a bad side effect, but all in all, it, that is the unfortunate thing is a lot of people do that, and then when they decide that they want to start losing weight. What's a good way to lose weight? Smoke. smoke. <laughs> Don't smoke. But smoking is a great way. If, you, if all you're going to do is eat or smoke, you will lose weight. You might lose a lung. But so you have to replace it with something. So sometimes it might be as simple as um, I'm going to go outside and chew gum instead of smoke. And so you have to replace it with something. You can't just take something away. This works. This is especially true with kids. If you want them to stop throwing a tantrum, they still need something from that tantrum. Any behavior that you are doing, you're getting something out of. So if a kid's throwing a tantrum, you can't just say stop throwing a tantrum. You have to tell them, you have to give them an effective way to get what they want. So instead of throwing a tantrum, I want you to write down a request of what you want, and then we'll sit down and talk about it. Unfortunately, I'm realistic. Is this going to work with small children most of the time? No, but that's why you set up something like a token system. Like, for every four times you write something down, you can get one thing. But if you if you throw a tantrum, we're going to take four tokens away. Reinforcement, punishment, classical conditioning, all together. This is way oversimplified because you're going to do an entire master's program just on behavioral therapy. But basically, it's just replacing one bad behavior with a more pro-social one. Okay? Um, systematic desensitization for a phobia, that's classical conditioning as a treatment. Okay? It's not, if you have a fear of flying, it does not strap you into a plane and take off. It is, and I haven't done this for a long time, but I had a, a young lady who um, had a deathly, deathly fear of flying. And it was completely, it was a phobia, but it was completely rational. When she was like eight years old, she went to, she was going on a vacation to Hawaii with her grandparents. And over Denver, one of the engines exploded. And she, uh, the pilot came over and the, the, the flight attendants were coming around and they were literally in like the flight, like grab your ankles, we're going down position. And they thought they were gonna, they were gonna wreck and then they actually, they landed belly down um, at a very small airport. Amazingly enough, they got her back on a plane and got her to Hawaii and back. But after that point, she never wanted to get on a plane again. Make sense? Yeah, I could see that. And then she was getting married, this is like, like 24, 26, or 20 years later, 18 years later, 20 years later, and her fiance surprised her with a beautiful honeymoon to the Caribbean. For those of you who don't know, can you drive to the Caribbean? No. No, unless you jump, you're really going to die. So she had to get over this fear of flying, so what did she do? This was this was back when a uh, small airport, South Bend Airport, you couldn't do this at like O'Hare, but they allowed us to come in over like a 12 week period, and the first time we went in, we just looked at the planes. The second time, we watched a plane taxi. Third time, uh, we watched a plane take off. Like, like week eight, she went out, walked down the tarmac, and put her hand on the plane. Week 12 was the week of her wedding, 
She went, sat down, buckled up, they fired up the plane, and then let her off. Every week, getting her closer and closer to flying, because week 13 was, we're going up in the air. I don't have a good end to that story, because I never heard from her again. I assume she got on the plane, everything went well. I actually watched that weekend to see if there was a crash between South Bend and the Caribbean, because that would have been the worst ending to that story ever, but there was no crash. So I'm assuming she got on the plane and everything is, is honky-dory. However, does anybody remember the term that she needed to be careful of for the rest of her life? Because even though, let's say that she got to the Caribbean and she came back and fear of flying is gone, just like if my fear of snakes is relatively gone, but what happens if one day down the road I see a snake and I just freak out? Relapse, that's, that is the clinical term for it, but in classical conditioning we have a different term. Spontaneous. Recovery, very good. Spontaneous recovery. It's when it's gone, <coughs> systematically desensitized, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it comes back. For that lady, she could have wiped gone to the Caribbean, kind of, I love flying, this is awesome. And then like, I want to be a flight attendant, this is so cool. And like 10 years, perfect for 10 years. And then out of nowhere, she could just have a huge meltdown. And that's why people who've been systematically desensitized, you still need, she would still need a backup if that were the case. Um, and what would that backup be? Boat. Boat? That would be an awesome backup functionally. I'm talking about like if she flips out on the plane. Can we talk her down at that point? She needs like a horse tranquilizer. I'm not talking like one or two packs. I'm talking like like, like three Ambien and just we're going to shotgun some tequila. Like we need to take you down because it's going to come back harder than ever, more symptomatic than ever. It may go away completely after that one time, but it's going to it, – Inevitably, it's probably going to come back, okay? Um, and so that's that's a, a spontaneous recovery. It just comes back out of nowhere, okay? So behavioral therapy has these weird quirks that other ones don't, okay? Why is behavioral therapy good? It's been around forever. So behaviorists have a lot of research. We can test it in the laboratory. This is why behaviorism became a thing, because psycho, psychodynamic theory, psychoanalytic theory was all philosophical. It was all theory. Behavioral model, we can test. We can, we can quantify it. And if there's one way to get your science, your soft science, which psychology still is a soft science, if there's one way to get a seat at the table with, with physics and, and chemistry and biology, if you want to be a hard science, it's quantify your research. Numbers, 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 because num and numbers that don't change. Not a Likert scale. Like, I feel like a seven today. Yesterday, I felt like a four. Well, that, that Scientists don't like that. But if it was, I had four behavioral outbursts yesterday, and after this intervention, I only had two, that's science. That's quantifiable, okay? The problems with this is that we, it's hard to figure out where things actually came from. We, we, my theory, my hypothesis, which I believe is a theory, that my fear of snakes came from this weird event that happened with bailing hay, it's... There's no evidence to back that up other than anecdotal evidence. And, and again, we fall back into the soft science of anecdotal evidence is not really good in science, okay? Behavior therapy is limited. I can't do behavior therapy with somebody with schizophrenia. I can't do behavior therapy with somebody who has suicidal ideations because their, their depression is so bad. I can't do personality disorders based on behavioral intervention. They are too, they are either too biologically anchored or they're too psychodynamically anchored. Behavioral skims the top. It does, for lack of a better term, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying that dealing with this population is easy, but it does the easy stuff from a scientific perspective. Okay? And also, it's seen as too simplistic. We don't, as human beings, we like to think. We are a complex organism that our emotions and our thoughts are, we control them. And we don't like the notion of thinking that some event, some small event that happened in our past is causing us to have these major problems today. Psychodynamic feels better.
because we feel like it's in our unconscious and we really can't touch it. But it's like, I tell you, your fear of a pig is because of this event. Now knock it off. And we feel like, as humans, we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than this one event. I'm bigger than a fear of wasp. I, you know, I, I've raved. Let's do this thing. And we don't like feeling like something so small can have such a big impact. It, it's, it's the same reason that we as humans <coughs> intuitively like to have conspiracy theories. We don't like thinking that one crazy dude, one crazy 24-year-old from Texas can kill the, the president or seven crazy dudes can, can take down the World Trade Center or a, a small crazy group of dudes or gals can do mass hysteria in the world or one crazy dude can take a shot, uh, uh, a modified gun and shoot 58 people and kill them in Las Vegas. We don't like that. We like to think that this must be some kind of government conspiracy because that at least makes sense to us. Same thing with behavioral model. We don't like the fact, I don't like the fact that, you know, one small event that happened and my dad wasn't trying to hurt me, wasn't trying to scar me, wasn't trying to make me afraid of snakes, but it happened. And we as humans don't like that. It's too simplistic. Unfortunately, it's kind of self-evident that these things do make sense, okay? So the behavioral model we will talk about with, with very specific diagnoses. Some we will never touch. Like schizophrenia, we will never touch the behavioral model because it's just silly to try to try to do some behavioral anchor, anchoring with schizophrenia. Same thing with the cognitive model. Take everything I just said about the behavioral model and apply thinking to it instead of behaving. The cognitive model is that we have, for lack of a better term, if you just remember cognitive model and thinking errors, you've pretty much conquered 85% of what's going on here. That we think, we, we, we misattribute our own thoughts and behaviors and others' thoughts and behaviors. So assumption, assumption, assumptions and attitudes are caused by misinterpreted events that we think about. Someone cancels a date or an event with you, and you immediately think, that person doesn't like me. Nobody likes me. I'm an unlikable person. I'm never going to be around anybody who likes me. I'm a miserable thing to be around. I should just bury myself in the basement. You see how I slipped real quick into a very dark place from something where it could have been that somebody got a flat tire. I got an email. Uh, I think I can pick on her. She's probably listening right now. I got an email from Emily that she had a, a car issue coming in today, and I I could attribute that to wow. She's lying about that car issue so she didn't have to come. This is miserable. I, I am an awful constructor. I'm an awful teacher. I should probably just quit right now so they can bring in something. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I probably just need to die. Did, did I slip real quick there into a really dirty, ugly place? Don't shake your head yes or no. Just think. Have you ever done that to yourself? I don't see anything. <laughs> but yeah, I, I know. We all have. I have. Everybody has. Everybody, you, you, you miss, you, you catastrophize things. You make assumptions about things. You, and sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. But even if you're right, you go like ten steps beyond the right. You ask, you ask somebody, hey, we'd like to go out this weekend. No, they're not interested. Fine. Does everybody have to be interested in you? No. Does that mean that you are unattractive and un, uh, un, nobody wants to be around you forever and ever? Amen. No. It's one person, but we tend to go this this big stinking thinking. Or thinking errors, okay? That's called an overgeneralization, a big overgeneralization, okay? Illogical thinking processes and faulty assumptions are what's the big part of the cognitive theory, okay? So I've kind of, I've kind of stepped into it a little bit, but if we combine cognitive with behavioral, all of a sudden, I have this overgeneralization. People didn't come to class today. It must be because I'm a bad instructor. I'm a bad instructor, so I really shouldn't be doing this for a living. Maybe I should look for some other line of work, or maybe I just didn't do anything because I'm not, you know what, I'm not going to come to work the rest of the week. I'll just call up and say I'm sick. 
And then by the end of the week, it's like, well, I'm not coming back because I'm already far behind and those students are far behind. They've been doing way better with somebody else. Maybe they can just get an internet class going. I don't know. I should just not. So my behavior is I've done some weird things that have reinforced my bad thinking. And so my behavior is reinforced my thinking. My thinking reinforces my behavior. It's, you can apply almost anything to this. I'm the doctor, I went to the doctor, the doctor told me that I should probably uh, change my diet because uh, I'm unhealthy. So I think, wow, you know, I'm unhealthy. Uh, probably, you know, I'm probably going to get heart disease and diabetes and cancer and all that stuff. Well, I can't really fix that now. I might as well still have some cheeseburgers because I've already screwed myself. I'm too old to fix this. Well, now I've had a couple cheeseburgers. I should probably just eat some more because I'm not going to fix it now. I'm not going to go work out now. Now I feel like crap. Oh my God, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I should probably just eat more because I am a miserable human being. Let's keep rolling and rolling and rolling. And so we get into these behaviors and cognitions that turn us into a loop. Okay? So we look at a guy by the name of Aaron Beck. Again, I'm not real big on names, but you should at least be able to recognize um, Aaron Beck was one of the first people to come up with a purely cognitive therapy where uh, the goal was to help the individual restructure their thinking. Describe, explain, predict, control. This is the control mechanism. Okay? Not what we're not going to say, we're not going to tell the individual, you are wrong. We're going to tell the individual, you need to think about this from different perspectives. Because if I tell you you're wrong, how many of you have ever had an argument with your significant other or your parents and they tell you you're wrong? Do you ever just say, you're right. I didn't think of it that way. You're so right, I am wrong. No, immediately when somebody tells you that you're wrong, what do you think? Deuce says, no, you're wrong. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> and so you have to, if you, if you have a plan that way, you have to get them thinking, what are some other possibilities of your thinking? What, you know, it's not necessarily that you're wrong, but what are some other ways of thinking about this? Let's restructure it. And then with any of those, because you always pick this avenue. You always pick that you get angry and you get aggressive. You gave me four other options. Could you try any of these other options? Would any of these work? And some people will say, no, I have to get aggressive. And if that's the case, then cognitive therapy is not going to work. But if you, know, if you get somebody to just think one thing, like, no, you know what? Maybe I'll just go in the basement and, and hit the punching bag instead of kicking the dog or whatever it is, bad thing I'm doing. And then as you get, as you get them thinking, I can control my behavior. I can control what I'm doing. I used to do this with kids when I worked at an alternative school, and it drove the teachers crazy because they thought I was giving them an out when the, a lot of them had a lot of aggression built up in them, and their behaviors, would, they would just get up and cuss out the teacher and throw the desk over. And so I would, in therapy, I would say, okay, here's what I want you to do. When you get mad at teacher X, I want you to stand up and I want you to scream at them, you're wrong, and walk out. Okay? Anybody here want to be a teacher? Pretend you're a teacher. Okay. If I told a student to do that to you, would you be real happy with me? <laughs> but think about the alternative. The student's already flipping desks and calling you a ember or ember or whatever. And so the whole goal of this is if I can get that student to stand up and scream at you, you're wrong, and walk out, then I can confront them. Because almost every student I ever worked with said, I can't control it. I can't, I need to get this out. And the minute that they do what I ask them to do, what do they just prove that they can do? They can control it. It may be maladaptive. It may not be the way we want them to control it, but we have changed their thinking from, I can't, to, oh, crap. I can, I just don't want to. And then we move. So it, it may be, this, this is going to sound horrible. And again, don't do drugs. But if, if you have an alcoholic and you say, you know, I need to drink at night, I need to drink. Well, you know, what if you, what if you smoke crack? Or uh, <laughs> don't do drugs. But the minute that they don't drink and they do something else, and crack is not a good idea, but like, I don't know, like shoplifted a Snickers bar. I don't know, something. Something still bad, but not as bad. 
And, and like, I, I get it. You know, I, I felt better afterwards. But you, you did control yourself, right? It, it changes people's ways of thinking. And sometimes it's, it's, it's like mental jujitsu. You can't just attack somebody like you're wrestling with them. You have to, it, therapy is all about dancing, not wrestling. Wrestling is what you do with your kids when you want to put them to bed at night. You fight with them, right? You go to bed. No, I don't want to go to bed. I, I want to watch more TV. No, you, dancing is we're going to get to bed together and we're going to do it in steps. We may end up going around the whole dance floor a few times, but we're going to do it together. That's therapy. Therapy and these interventions are all dancing. Dancing, not wrestling, okay? Cognitive therapy, probably most used in depression. Because think about it. Who are, who are people who have the worst thinking thinking? Not schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is psychotic. They are literally, it's not thinking, it's thinking, thinking, it's wrong thinking. It's irrational thinking. Depression is, is irrational, but it's also a lot of what you cause within yourself. Is there a biological component to depression? Absolutely. Can cognitive therapy fix depression without a biological intervention as well? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But this needs to be a component because if you just keep popping pills into a person, they're never going to grow and they're, they're, just gonna, they're gonna feel better about having bad thoughts. You have to fix the bad thinking as you're going, okay? Why is this good? It works for a lot of people. It is effective. It's a uniquely human process. You cannot do cognitive therapy with your dog, your cat, no matter how much you talk to them, you cannot get them to do what you want them to do. Try rationalizing pooping on the floor to your dog. Why did you poop on the floor? What were you feeling before you pooped on the floor? Are you trying to tell me something with pooping on the floor? Guess what, you're never gonna get anywhere. It's a human process, okay? The problem with it, it doesn't help everybody. First off, you have to have the cognitive capacity. So those people that I work with, people with developmental disabilities, cognitive therapy is never going to work. One of, one of the hardest things, working with staff. Has anybody ever worked in that field, working like as a staff with developmentally disabled people? One of the hardest things to get through to staff is don't try to counsel. Because everybody wants to be a counselor when they do something wrong and try to get the feelings out. It's like, no, they, they don't have the capacity for that. And that's not an insult. It's, it's, it's not that, and some do, but it's not an insult. It's just, you're going to make them more frustrated because they don't think the same way we do, the same way somebody with schizophrenia doesn't think the same way we do. So you're never gonna get somebody who's seeing and hearing things that aren't really there to think correctly because they're not seeing the same world that we are. Um, and then some changes may not be possible, okay? Um, there are newer therapies that go along with cognitive, like acceptance, acceptance and commitment therapies. There's reality therapy and choice therapy, uh, mindfulness-based techniques. Um, these are all just versions um, of cognitive therapies. Sometimes they mix in some Eastern philosophy. Sometimes they mix in, they mix in religion. It's just a different way of thinking. Okay? All right. Humanistic. I'm not going to spend much time on these last ones because they're not really all that big, but I need you to at least be exposed. Humanistic. Maybe you know what this one is, Carl Rogers. And maybe Abraham Maslow, but mostly Rogers. Easy way to remember this. Humanistic existential. Humanistic is all about positive psychology. People are good, and they just don't get enough good feelings. So a humanistic therapist would be the most probable one if you ever got hugged by a therapist or a psychologist they're probably humanistic they're really big on reinforcing what a good person you are telling you what you what your strengths are so imagine if you had mr rogers as a therapist some of you don't know who mr rogers is. um or, like uh what's, what's daniel tiger for the younger generation look it up daniel tiger is a cartoon version of mr rogers made out of a Cartoon Tiger. Yeah, we, I wish we could, but he's gone. Uh, but he, he's got the trolley and everything. Yeah, it's really sweet. The first time I watched it, it's like a little tiger and he's singing the song. It's like very sweet. She needs to visit the park again. She's awesome. Um, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be like a super happy, you know, like Barney. I'm trying to catch every generation here. Mr. Rogers, Barney, Daniel Tiger. Okay. Um, 
Carl Rogers, Mr. Rogers, mystic <laughs> view, okay? Existentialist view, basically, and, and we're not gonna we're not gonna delve into this very much at all because this gets way into, into philosophy that 205 we're not ready for. But basically, the, the existential view is that as humans today, we, we are not as autonomous as what we should be, that we don't have the choices that we think we should, and we are very inauthentic, that um, that we, we are forced into certain behaviors, we're forced into certain things that make it so that we cannot be our true self, okay? So this one is, you're better than what you think you are, this is you're not even who you think you are. And the treatment is way more in depth, usually you're only gonna see that with adults, okay? Um, spiritual views on intervention, again, it's incredibly difficult to completely ignore the religious aspect, and it's also incredibly hard to try to incorporate it into a 205 class. Um, if this were a year long, I probably could do a much better job of trying to integrate back and forth between the religious ideation and the scientific ideation. And on most accounts, they there are similar there are more similarities than there are differences. The goal is to make the person feel better. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of evidence to show that spirituality has a lot of psychological benefit to people. However, you have to look at the polar opposite. You have to look at the polar end. There are certain groups, there are certain people who believe that spirituality usurps psychology and biology. That you don't need any psychology, you don't need any science because religion houses everything inside of this, this bubble. And then there are other people who say, here's the bubble of science and religion doesn't need to permeate that. It would be much better if we could all just kind of get along. But unfortunately, those two, those two worlds tend to butt heads more than almost any. Um, so we'll talk about how spiritual interventions sometimes play, uh, play a part. And then we'll also talk about times where spiritual interventions actually are detrimental, um, especially like, and again, I'm harping on this one diagnosis, but schizophrenia. Um, religious interventions with schizophrenia oftentimes are catastrophic because you're dealing with somebody who does, who is hallucinating and delusional, and you're offering them interventions that are quasi-hallucinogenic. Not saying religion is a, halluc is a hallucination, but faith requires somewhat of a hallucination, right? Because you don't see it. Faith is taking something without any evidence. Hallucination is experiencing with, with no evidence. They're very similar, and that sounds awful, but they really are. You know, religion, the faith aspect, and hallucinations, they're kind of the same thing on a different point. One is considered to be pro-social, the other is considered to be against society. So we'll talk about that as we get to the specific diagnoses, okay? Um, Okay, finally, last one. The social cultural model. The social cultural model is very similar to the medical model in that every model either should have a socio cultural component or needs to have a social cultural component. I will be the first to admit, and I think I talked about this last week, but maybe not. Um, when I started working, my very first, you know, um, uh, group was a sociocultural group that I was not familiar with. I grew up in small town, Indiana, um, as milky white as you can get. I mean, it, it was honky town. We were all, I mean, just Caucasian, Caucasian, Caucasian. And so my first, and I, I had experiences from undergrad and graduate school, but until I got into my population that I was working with, which was like 60% Latino, uh, 60%, more than half Latino, and then the next high population was African American, and then the next one was um, white Caucasian mixed. And I was a fish out of water because I I knew the book, I knew the lyrics, I didn't know the, I didn't know the tune. And so did I tell you? I think I told you this about the the young man who was 14, who was the head of the household. No. Just to give you an example of how my, my sociocultural model needed to be changed, um, I was working with a young man who was at an alternative school because he could not behave himself 
at school. So they put him in this alternative school. He was 14 years old. He was uh, Puerto Rican. He had four younger sisters in the house. He had his mom in the house who was working two jobs, about 90 hours a week, and his father was serving a life sentence for murder. He was 14 years old. When he's at school, he's treated like a 14-year-old boy in middle school. Sit down. Shut up. No, you can't go to the bathroom right now. No, you can't have a drink. At home, he's not only the father figure of the house, his mom's hardly ever home, so he is the parent. He is the, he's the adult. And so not only did I, I, I didn't fathom a 14-year-old being left alone with four younger sisters, I couldn't fathom, you know, just the behavioral problems, and I couldn't fathom all these things. And, I had to really take myself out of the equation and look at this from almost like a helicopter perspective and say, this is a different culture, this is a different societal issue, this is a different socioeconomic grouping that I have not dealt with, and I cannot come at this young man like I would everybody else. Because he basically was living in two different worlds, and it was, it was a conflict for him. I mean, think, think if you went home tonight, and some of, this, may, this may hit home with some of you. If some of you are still living at home with mom and dad, and they treat you like you're still in middle school, but you're an adult, kind of the, the backwards version of this, it's a very hard uh, socio-economic, social-cultural way to live. And so I had to take, I had to look at it from a completely different perspective. And I think every single person that you that you would work with who has a psychiatric or or mental illness issue, you have to take into account the social. I cannot look at somebody from a different culture and immediately say that what they're experiencing is weird. Because there are cultures where people talk to the dead. It is very common in Asian cultures for uh, people to talk to their dead ancestors, literally have conversations with them. In our culture, is that kind of odd? You guys never talk to the dead, right? Nobody goes on Sunday morning and just sits for an hour and very uncomfortable chair and talks to a dead guy. See how these things kind of play into each other, but we, we all look at the other and say, well, that's weird, but my thing is right. Social cultural says we have to take everybody where they are. We have to understand where they're coming from. And that doesn't mean you have to be a social justice warrior. It doesn't mean that you have to be a, a, a expert on every society in the world. But if you're going into a helping profession, or you're going into nursing, you're going into psychology, you're going into business, anything, teaching, you have to realize when you are outside of your element. You have to realize when I can't, uh, this is outside of my scope of expertise. Um, and it's not a fun thing because we don't like admitting that, but it's a great learning situation when you can admit that and then have somebody come in and help you understand where you're missing things. Um, some of you, if I put you into somebody, if I just mixed up everybody, just randomly you pulled out of a hat and you took over somebody else's life in this room, you went home to their family, their friends, you would be a fish out of water. And to be perfectly honest, we're pretty homogenous in this room. As much difference as there is, we're pretty homogenous. And think how different it would be if we were talking about different continents, you know, that we were throwing people everywhere. You have to take those things into consideration when you're looking at what's wrong with them, okay? Um, so the family social treatments, those social cultural treatments, um, we're going to focus on things like group therapy, family therapy, couples therapy, um, and then something relatively new. When I say relatively, it's been around for like 15 years, but wrap around. We're at Ivy Tech actually trying to start a wrap around program here. Maybe it's just the wording but it scares the heck out of me because wraparound is very intensive in community mental health. Um, it's basically getting everybody around the table and trying to help people get to where they need to be. Um, I thought it would be awesome if I could have every one of my students have a wraparound team that included like 15 different people who were advocating for you. But at some point, I would have like 800 people sitting around trying to fix and trying to work with people. So the community treatment, for most of you, you don't really need this type of thing, but for some people, they probably do in, a, in an educational setting. Um, with family social treatment, we're dealing with the unit rather than the individual, that there's a faulty unit. Um, 
nine times out of ten, the identified client in a family social structure, the identified client is not the problem. Nine times out of ten, when mom and dad bring Junior in because Junior can't get his crap together, who do I really want to get on the couch? Mom and dad. Yeah. Because Junior's pretty malleable. Even if I even if I fix Junior every week, where is he going home to for 153 more hours? Mom and dad. So um, with family therapy, family therapy is the bane of everyone's existence. Um, if anybody's ever seen like the old, 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 old Simpsons where they hooked, and hooked each other up to a shock machine and every time somebody said something, every, you could shock somebody in your family, I wish I had one of those. Um, because that would be perfect for, for family therapy. Um, but again, HIPAA and ethics and can't kill people. Um, Big thing here, um, the one thing that I really focus on here is research on the sociocultural model is very difficult um, because just because things happen together doesn't mean one thing causes the other. Okay, so just because there's a sociocultural group that all have the same problem, that doesn't mean being in a sociocultural group makes you have that problem. And that's what a lot of people look at. They say that the big thing right now in education is grit. That, um, Students who have grit tend to do better than students that don't have grit. But what they fail to look at is just because somebody finishes doesn't mean that they had grit, and having grit doesn't mean that you're going to finish, but they try to put those two things in as causation rather than correlation. It's just kind of a silly thing. But every couple of years, the school systems come up with some weird new name or word that they love. Grit's the thing. Okay. We spent two days on models. But we, we really needed to because this is, this is going to keep coming back at us over and over and over throughout the semester. Okay? So, any questions about the particular models? We'll, we'll, we'll review them again as we go. So, if you don't have them all the way down, that's okay. All right. So, for Wednesday, Chapter 4, Test and Assessment, um, should get through that on Wednesday. Relatively straightforward chapter. Um, but then we have exam number one. I don't know if that will open on Wednesday or if it will open on Monday. I think I want to do a review with you guys, so it may open on Monday. It's going to be online. Um, and then also, after we do chapter four, that will give me the opportunity to talk to you about the term project uh, because we'll have the assessment uh, lecture done. So we'll go over the term project sometime next week. And then last, and this is going to be, just, just remember this, when we're done with chapter four, we go to chapter 19. So we go, one, two, three, four, 19, five, six, seven, eight. It's, it's, it's weird, but it's just, I don't know, for when it, it's about forensics and it works really well if we go right after four. Right? So just remember that as you're, if you're, if you're skimming ahead. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? Okay, I will see you all on Wednesday.